Hello, welcome everybody. I'm glad to have you here on this nice Sunday afternoon. Um, before we begin with the program today, I want to say a few words about this and that. First of all, let me thank the Iowa City Public Library for allowing Project Green and all of us to do this here and to provide us such good uh, audiovisual support. I particularly want to thank Beth Fisher, who's over there in the <laughs> AV room giggling. Uh, she has laryngitis today, so she couldn't introduce herself. Um, and this program, as you probably know, is going to be recorded, shown on public or uh, on um, cable television channel 10, and it will be recorded onto a DVD that can be checked out by people in the future from the library. Um, and it's for that reason that we encourage you not to add too many comments or ask questions during the original presentation. If you have questions, write them down on your piece of paper. And after the coffee and cookie break, we will do a question and answer session where you can pick our speaker's brain. Uh, the reason is uh, if you ask questions during the presentation, the listening audience at home won't be able to hear them. So um, questions are not forbidden, but you get it. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Project Green, which is the organization that along with the public library, puts on these events in the spring. Project Green's a volunteer organization of people who um, raise money to beautify our public spaces in Iowa City and public schools with shrubberies and um, trees. There's a lot of evidence of the plantings of Project Green all over Iowa City that you probably just take for granted, but it's been a very vigorous, very busy organization to fundraise, we, our biggest fundraiser is a plant sale that's happening May, help me somebody, the 5th, the first Saturday in May, and then we're going to have a, a garden tour, Pub, private gardens around town are opened up for everybody, uh, June 24, okay, and I uh, hope we can see you there. Um, these spring garden forums or winter garden forums, um, we, it's just something we do just to give back to all the hardworking volunteers that take part in these projects to help raise money. Um, we, uh, Project Green puts out a newsletter twice a year. There are a number of hard copies on the table back here, and you can go to the website, projectgreen.org, to sign up for an emailed version of the newsletter and just keep up on whatever happen, is happening with this organization. Um, the librarian, Beth, has put out a number of books related to the topic here today. Um, all those are available for checkout, but we do ask that you take them to the desk and check them out if you want them. But they're here for you to look at, and please do look over them during the break. Um, I think I've covered everything. One more thing. There is on the, on the treat table back there, where all the cookies are, there is a, a list of plants in a folder that are much needed by the people running the shade perennial booth at our sale. So if you have a shady garden and you like to garden, have a look there. If you have extra, um, we'd be delighted if you donate some to the sale. Um, the list looks like this, and it's on that um, treat table back there. Okay, before we get started, could I ask that you all turn off your cell phones or at least make them so they don't make noise? And it's with great pleasure today that I introduce Dick Baker, who, who I, I first heard Dick talk up about three years ago. Um, I was taking a class at senior college called Iowa's Ailing Landscape. No kidding. Um, and there were a number of good speakers. Dick was one. And I was most taken with his talk because it his property reminded me so much of mine. And it has so many of the same properties that my property has. Um, Dick was um, is a retired geologist and taught for the University of Iowa for many years. He was the first director of the UI Environmental Science Program, and he taught courses combining geology and ecology for over 36 years. Um, Dick has had a lifelong interest in environment and is con con increasingly concerned about the proliferation of environmental problems, as we all know. Dick will be talking about how he has um, attempted to cure some of these problems by taking care of his own property, one acre at a time. Dick Baker.
Well, thank you very much, Mary, and thank you for inviting me. I've been a fan of Project Green for 40, well, since it started, I guess. Um, <clears throat> I <clears throat> got a chance to, in 1999 when I retired, uh, to move out into the country. Uh, there was 125 acres of woods and ponds and pasture and old cropland. But I had a very nice home in Coralville that I lived in for over 30 years, around 30 years anyway. And um, it actually, it's much nicer than the house I have now. Um, I'm not a farm boy. I don't never lived in the country before. And I don't want any tractors or anything else. Every, most of the things I do are by hand. Why would I want to move out in the country? Well, this place was owned by a long time friend of mine. Some of you may have known him, Bill Furnish. Uh, he was also a professor in geology. And he bought this land and built a house out there in the mid-'70s. And I was visited him many times out there, and um, I, I just got to love the place. And he called me out of the blue one day and said, would you be interested in buying my place? He was 86 years old and didn't feel he could take care of it like he wanted to. So I gave it a um, very deep thought for about a quarter of a second. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, boy, I'd be delighted. And so ever since, I guess, we feel like we're in paradise out there. I always wanted to be able to, I loved prairies and woods and so forth. I always wanted to be able to, uh, instead of driving someplace, to just walk out my door and be in one. And now I, that's what my situation. And uh, I'm doing stuff that I think is ecologically valuable. Um, I get all kinds of exercise. I'm in better health now than I was 15 years ago, for goodness sake. Uh, what's not to, what reasons are there not to do that? And then we can have, when you still are learning new things at my age all the time, wow, it's exciting. Um, we have fun trying new wild foods every once in a while. We've bought a bunch of different books on a variety of things. There's foragers harvest edible wild plants, for example, and you can eat quite a few different kinds of plants. Just trying, in fact, and then yesterday I was making, uh, 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 tapping maple trees and boiling maple sap. So there's all kinds of things that make the living out in the country very desirable for me. So the purpose of my talk, I guess, is to share my experience in trying to live with the environment, tread lightly on the earth, all that good stuff, uh, heal the wounds. And so I'm going to give you some background, uh, a little bit of history of the land then, and then talk about some of the problems that I encountered that I wanted to deal with. Um, and our efforts, and I say ours, my wife Deb and I both uh, are involved in, in these things, uh, what some of our efforts were and the outcomes. So. I guess I'm kind of an old-fashioned naturalist. I've gotten to, you know, I like to, to look at the bar birds and the butterflies and the mushrooms and all this stuff. So, um, so let's take a look then at uh, the, the past here. Geologists by nature are interested in time. What, how, uh, you look at a rock and how did it get there and how long ago was it formed? And uh, how fast did a change occur? How extensive? Many of the large changes, most of them take, well, hundreds more like thousands or millions of years. I mean, extinctions, evolution, mountain building, all climate change, all these things. I think never has the Earth changed as fast or as much as it has in the last 150 years. I'm starting then by telling you about uh, some changes that involve someone I had direct contact with, and that's my grandmother. She was born in Assad House, 
Oops. Very much like that. That isn't her sod house, but a sod house in eastern South Dakota. Her job was herding cattle when she was growing up. And to do this, she had to be on horseback because the prairie grasses were as far as the eye could see and they were as high as the back of a horse. She'd lose the cattle if she weren't on horseback. That was the prairie. At that time, of course, there were no cars, no planes, no radio, no TV, no cell phones. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, I had to throw that in. <clears throat> Uh, and travel was by horse and buggy. And the wildlife then, uh, as she described it, and as you read about it, was mind-boggling. Millions of ducks and geese and swans and sandhill cranes and pelicans and prairie chickens and passenger pigeons and bison and elk and so forth. Let, in fact, let's take, you think about passenger pigeons, let's talk about a sad story. They may have been the most abundant bird ever. A flock uh, es was estimated near Dubuque to be 600 million. I don't know who made the estimate or how you'd even make an estimate like that, <laughs> but it was a big flock anyway. <laughs> and one colony in Wisconsin covered 8 by 125 miles. Flocks returning in the spring would take two to three days to pass over. And this bird became extinct in 1914. How could that be? Well, that sort of thing is still going on, not maybe as dramatically as that, but we have millions of acres of prairie, wetlands, clear streams and waters. Uh, the old Iowa naturalist Bohemo Schimmick had a quote I, I loved. In the 1890s, he said that if things keep on as they have been, you won't be able to see the bottom of the Iowa River anymore. When's the last time you saw the bottom of the Iowa River? <laughs> so we are completely altering the earth. And between her time and mine, just two or three generations, the world is completely different. Iowa has the most altered landscape of any, and vegetation of any state. 99.9% .9 of, of Iowa's original prairie disappeared between 1830 and 1900. 29 million acres, that was, 83% of the total land area. 85% of the wetlands have disappeared. And Iowa is 49th out of, out of 50 states in public land preservation. 47th in per person conservation spending. And it has the worst surface waters in, in the country. Hmm. What can one person do here? You have to make a start someplace. Well, there still are a few prairies in Iowa, and they're not the same, really. They're, prairie people call them postage stamp prairies. I mean, there, aren't, there are only a couple that have any elk or bison on them. None have any wolves or anything like that. But, um, so still, there's an urge. I've often had a strong urge to learn about prairies before I, when my, my grandmother described it, and I was just a kid. And... Um, I find that they're absolutely entranced and enthralled. I'm enthralled by them. But I think you all know what a prairie is. It's a rich assemblage of grasses and flowers. Probably no trees except long rivers. A lot of times two, three hundred species at, in one acre. Lots of different flowers through the season so that if you go different times of year, it's wonderful to see that, to see that progression. And of course, Prairies uh, are one of the two things that have given Iowa rich, its rich soil, the other being glaciers, which came down from Minnesota, ground up all the different rocks in Minnesota, spread them nicely out over the landscape. And then we had the prairie on there to provide the organic content. Well, um, so I moved to Cedar County 12 years ago. And I want to share with you my approach to following Aldo Leopold's land ethic. I, I consider Leopold to be the, the pioneer in really how we should be looking at the land. He said, 
a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic landscape. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. See, Leopold uh, mentions that ethics involve a standard of conduct and moral judgment. He said, we should apply that to the land. So, here was my chance to put Aldo Leopold's land ethic to practical use. We could try to, to restore or create biodiversity, landscape stability, natural habitats. So the first year when we moved out there, I just walked around a lot and looked, tried to see what we had. And I enlarged a topographic map of the area. And here we have that. So the blue line outlines my place. There's our house. And you can see that uh, this area is now our prairie. Um, you can also see, I think, the brown lines, most of you probably know, are contour lines, a line of equal elevation. And so the Cedar River is up there. And we are about 100, 100 feet above the Cedar River. But you see also that when contour lines are close together, the land is steep. When they're spread apart widely, it's flat. We've got a lot of steep land. And all these little things are gullies. And those gullies tend to be heading up into this flat land. And all of them drain down into that upper pond, then around to the lower pond, and right into the Cedar River. So, so what, some of the things that I noted then were that gullies were rapidly eroding into the property. The second thing is that the ponds that you see, which by the way, my predecessor put in the, the land, these are old quarries, and he thought, why not dam them up and make a pond? And this, they're very nice, I like them. But they were beginning to fill in with silt from all that erosion. And every big storm would have a sediment plume coming around the corner and spreading through the pond. And I still recall long ago when he owned it, I went fishing down there one time, and we were down in the far end of the pond. Uh, there. <laughs> and uh, fishing in about oh, three, four feet of water. There's that much water there now. That's how fast that it was filling in from all that erosion. Well, so I said that was certainly another thing. Um, also, what was originally an open oak savanna right out in front of our house, and that would be right out here, was then now overgrown by trees that big around. Now, savannas are very open areas with a few trees, and, and they have a, a nice uh, array of undergrowth and so forth. But when they become completely shaded, that changes the whole ground cover. And, and what happens is you get a lot of small trees with dense, dense undergrowth that's hard even to walk through. Formerly open pastures were now sort of full of, of what I call kind of trash trees, pioneer trees, honey locusts and things like that, that, that come in and get started and sort of take over. Um, and also lots of thorny underbrush. And then finally, the place was rapidly becoming overgrown by invasive species. So clearly, if we wanted a, quote, natural landscape, like what was here prior to settlement, I had a lot of work to do. 
also clearly this would not happen. That is, uh, we would not have a natural landscape uh, if I just let things be. I think, you know, in, I think this is kind of a romantic notion of many city dwellers that, oh, you have a woods, you don't have to do anything. You know, they'll take care of themselves. Well, that was before invasive species came in, I guess, but, uh, but it certainly isn't true now. So I started by making an inventory of what I had. Again, I go back to Aldo Leopold. To paraphrase him, the first step in intelligent tinkering is to find all the pieces. So I started uh, making an inventory of the plants. Uh, so I have, actually I brought them in just to, if anyone is particularly interested, but I have uh, oh, over 370 species of plants. I have a list of the birds. The bird club came out and helped me with that. Uh, see Karen back there. Um, and it's over 100 species now. Uh, butterflies and moths. I have dragonflies. A friend of mine, Bob Cruden, uh, did a whole study on the state of Iowa's dragonflies. And he came out and identified all the dragonflies. The, I got the land snails. I got the mushrooms. The mushroom club came out and helped me with those. <laughs> and uh, I've got uh, the list of the mammals and frogs. And so uh, I kind of know what I've got. Uh, I, I do the frog survey every spring in summer. Uh, you have, they give you a, you, you do it by sound, and they give you a recording. And so you go out in the evenings and listen, and oh, yeah. That's an eastern gray tree frog there I'm hearing. And I got eight different frogs on my plate. I didn't know there were eight different frogs in the state before. So I'm always learning stuff. It's wonderful. Um, so steps to, oh, and also made a land use plan too. So uh, I, I have learned a lot. Uh, but I still got a lot to learn. I've. Uh, Let's like take a look then at how we could deal with gully erosion. It can be very rapid, and um, you can see here actually in, in this these sequence of photos. This is 1951. That first of all, a little bit of the history of the land. Uh, it was quite open. This whole area. This is the area that uh, is now prairie. Uh, but, and you, you can see it was cropland even then. Um, but note the change. That's what it looks like, oh, five years ago. And yeah, here's that cropland. That completely got covered by forest. It's all total uh, forest now. So that's changed a lot. All right, so let's look at what happens when it rains heavily, and especially before I I mean, it still happens to some degree. If it rains three or four inches, you can't stop this from happening. But, um, but every, it, r practically every rainfall, the whole bottom of the valley was muddy, roiling water. And there's our pond below the house like it looked in, in the uh, early spring. This is what it looks like in the summer, very attractive. And then uh, a few years back, this is what it looked like a little bit later in the summer. I, I had an elderly lady that came out uh, and looked over the edge and saw that, and he said, she said, oh, you have a golf green on your place. <laughs> I said, no, that's my pond. So um, those are uh, duckweeds and algae and stuff that tell you that there's too much nutrients coming into the pond. So gullies are one of the sources of erosion that's bringing all that stuff in. And uh, gullies uh, are, erosion is kind of concentrated in many gullies on what are called nick points. And if you can imagine, this is the slope of, of the land in a gully, a nick point is where there's just a small waterfall here. You know, maybe only two or three feet high, but it's just a little waterfall. So water coming down here comes over and pounds down on the soil. Now, this is not bedrock. This is loess, which is pretty easily erodible. And so it comes under and pounds down there, undercuts it, and it moves upstream. 
And so that gully erodes headward very rapidly. Well, so that's one of the uh, factors about um, that we need to think about for gullies. The other is uh, the volume of water that comes down. The more water, the rapid, more rapid the erosion. So let's uh, see what we can do about it. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry. Th this gully is over in the Lus Hills. This isn't my gully. Uh, but you can see a, a geology field trip over there. And this is the midpoint, actually. Uh, geology field trip looking down at that. And that's from that vantage point looking down. And look at the size of that and the vertical walls. Now, I went over to the Lus Hills many years ago to uh, look at, a, at an archaeological site. And we drove across. An, about an 80-foot deep canyon to get there. And when I got there, there was an 80-year-old farmer. Uh, and we got to talking, and he said, yeah, when I was a kid, we used to just drive across the stream there. He, it, they had 80 feet of erosion in 80 years. That tells you a lot about how fast gullies erode. And this is a view of Great Plains from, from an airplane. And, you can see all these little things are gullies, and this is cropland. How long do you think that cropland is going to be there? Because cropland is very erodible, especially these days, the way we farm. Well, here is a, a little nick point on my place. And you can see I've piled a bunch of, I mean, one, oh, yeah, one, uh, one way of dealing with this, uh, a, lot, a lot of farmers practice is they throw all their old, worn-out appliances down there. And you can, <laughs> you can see these down here. I decided not to go that route. <laughs> uh, so I got lots of dead wood, trees fall over and so forth. So I, by piling those right at the bottom of that little nick point, the water that's coming down, instead of pounding into the soil, gets, hits all those trees, uh, all those branches, and has almost no erosive power. And there's my colleague inspecting my work. <laughs> um, and this was the biggest uh, gully that I had. I guess it's about 12 feet the way it was from there down to the bottom. And I, a large tree uh, fell over. And you can see it right up there. Uh, the large branch crossed the bottom. And that that kind of hit with me, well, maybe this, this, has, this has some promise. And so, and then the more of the stuff, um, <clears throat> uh, the wood fell into here. That used to be a, a little nick point there, a little vertical waterfall. Once that tree fell in there and the, those other things were there, it evened out. Now, that doesn't mean there's no erosion. That does mean that it's way less, and it's much less likely to rapidly erode upstream. So, and then I played around with various other ways of sort of slowing things up. Uh, made a funny little stick dams like that one. And so this, this one, I thought, oh, there's a big log across there. And then I'll put some sticks there, and the log will hold it in place. Just to show you how accurate my reasoning is, um, after well, the last big uh, flow, the log moved, but the stick stayed in place. <laughs> so now I am just using sticks, and they are working pretty well, actually. And there's uh, what it looks like pretty much now. So, uh, and, and by the way, then uh, a lot up, just upstream from the sticks, uh, when the water goes down, you'll see a lot of sediment in there, lots of leaves and other things that uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not going to stop them completely. Uh, they'll eventually get there, but it's slowing them down. So you can see a little bit of brown right at the end there uh, after one of the rainfalls, but it's not, nothing like it used to be. The other thing that I toyed around with a little bit is there's a, you can see a big gully underneath that tree there. So... I thought, well, what if I could divert the water a little bit? So there was a bunch of downed logs there. And you can see, I put them 
here so that instead of all that water coming in there, someone would hit the log, be drained off this way and down slope. And that slowed that one up as well. So there's lots of different little ways to play the game, I guess. <clears throat> there's, now there's still a lot of, uh, yeah, and then you can see a little brown spots there. That's, that's in that big gully there, and I put some stick dams there. Lots of muddy water, especially right upstream from those. Okay, there's the map again. <clears throat> and so, okay, I've tried to um, deal with the midpoint problem. What about the volume of flow? Is there anything I can do about that? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. And what I did about that is I hired a contractor to come in and put dams uh, around these, dam them up here. And so everything that would have come in here and down stops there. And it also has the advantage of forming some very nice little wetlands. And I collected some local wetland seeds and got them started in there. So this was what it looked like right after the contractor left. And the dam is this thing here. And he scooped out that. Uh, <coughs> And it was amazing how rapidly life got into those. <laughs> oh, I wasn't, didn't mean my dog there, but actually. <laughs> um, the, lots of dragonfly larvae and all, you know, lots of stuff. Just in a few weeks, frogs found those things right away. And as it evolved, this is what it looked like. Actually, I was afraid, this was after one or two storms, that, it, that the water would go up and overflow and cut through the dam. It didn't. And the next year, uh, or two, a couple of years later, I guess, that you can still see the dam over on the right-hand side. But there's a good, a nice array of uh, wetland plants getting started. Then the water's a little lower. Lots of arrowheads and other things. A little lower. Actually, some years it dried up. It, it, a couple of the wetland plants didn't make it when it dried up, but most of them are still there. And it's still serving its purpose. That is, that water would have gone down the gullies directly. It's stopped there, and it never goes down the gullies. And so a lot of the volume of water that's going down there is now stopped by those. Here's uh, the biggest one of those. Uh, early on, and then in a, uh, a year or two later, and then the, it got down, the, that's about the lowest. This one never did dry up. Anyway, then the other thing is I planted prairie. Um, and there's one thing that when you're planting prairie that you really learn, and that is patience. Um, this was the first year, and has, you noticed lots of very nice yellow flowers there. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're dandelions, of course. <laughs> I hardly could stand to walk up there the first year. <laughs> or red clover. Both of those, of course, are non-native weeds. Um, then, <clears throat> to get to prairies um, need to be burned. At least there's some argument about how often, but. That's one way of sort of starting to control the weeds. And so uh, after a couple of years, we uh, started burning. And I try to keep a map. I never burn it all. Leave, leave some of it unburned. Because uh, for one thing, lots of insects may be uh, living there. And if you burn it all, they're gone. But if you don't burn it all, they survive and can spread back into the burned area. Um, and so this is what it looked like that first year. A couple of uh, uh, friends, uh, Liz Moss, by the way, is a former student, now has her own company, Transition Ecology, and they do all kinds of this work and get paid for it. Um, so that's, that was uh, that burn. And you can, well, actually, you can see a little teeny bit of how big the fire was. That's, that's it down there. <laughs> Um, then, uh, yeah, so that, this is kind of what it looked like right, right after that. They came back that next fall. That's what it looked like. 
Wow. So, but it takes a while. And so then it goes through after in about the third through the fifth or sixth year, what often people call the sea of yellow phase. <laughs> and so that's what you're looking at here, but very attractive. There's lots of uh, nice different flowers that, uh, prairie flowers that are growing in there. Um, um, Liatris, which is, uh, um, anyway. Um, butterfly milkweed, see the little bee down there? Um, uh, bottle gentian, and a very attractive, not too common plant. Now when you burn, it's a little more exciting. Um, and we had a burn a couple years ago, and when you burn, you start on uh, the downwind side and sort of gradually get a, a nice fire lane all around it. And then you start the head fire. And the head fire that last year had flames about 50 feet high. Unbelievable. But they didn't get away and it uh, does the job. And so that was the crew of that year. Another more see the yellow phase. And just uh, my weak attempt at a little artsy picture. <laughs> and <laughs> of the, the moon and the, some different prairie plants there. And there's me being happy in my prairie, so. <laughs> All right, so. Um, what did I leave out here? So, oh yes. Um, the other really uh, important aspect of prairies uh, that goes right into the whole erosion business is how amazingly well they soak up water during rainfall. Unbelievable. And again, I'm, I'm old, I tell stories. Here's a story that I, I, uh, I taught one, um, some summers up at uh, Iowa Lakeside Lab at Lake Okoboji. And one of those summers was 1993, which at that time was the wettest year in history, and after about a four inch rain on totally saturated ground, I thought, you know, I wonder what runoff was like at a native prairie. So I went over to Kaler Prairie, which is a wonderful native prairie up by Lakeside Lab. On the way over, we noticed that the golf course was basically almost underwater and there were huge rivers flowing through it. The farm fields were absolute mud flows, practically. I, I mean, I don't think you could have waded across one of the little drainage areas in a shallow drainage areas in a farm field. It was, I've never seen anything like it. So I was getting a little worried when I got out to the prairie, because there's a little stream that runs down the slope. Got over there, and the, the water level had gone up by about that much, and the water was running clear. Wow. I couldn't believe it. Well, I do now because the same thing happens in my place now. And those little, little wetland areas that I put in up along the edges of the prairie there, which filled up so rapidly the first year or two, I can have a pretty big rain and you won't even see the water go up. It just soaks right into the prairie. And I wish I had made a, a slide of this, but uh, that here's a little uh, drawing of prairie plants showing the roots. You can look at it afterwards if you like. And uh, there's the ground. And you can see that the whole ground underneath is taken up by root systems. So they are just sponges in soaking up water. And they had, there's been very, very impressive. <clears throat> So, um, so I know I have a, I can just go out my door and walk through. Now, it isn't nearly as good as a native prairie restoration where you still had prairie there. I started from scratch. I put 60 species in, and I don't, I know that all of them didn't all, all come up. And, and I have added a few species through the years. But I don't know, if I had 60 or 70 species instead of the two or 300 species that a native 
I'd even be happier, but I'm pretty happy now, so. All right, well, it, this is, I think, one of the m loveliest uh, of kinds of trees that you see. Uh, isn't that amazing? This is over at Rochester Cemetery. I think some of you have been there. And, um, but look at the shape of it. Why is it shaped like that? Well, trees in a forest, they grow straight, they get big, tall, and then they spread out of here. Because they grow too light. And in the forest, where's light? It's up. In a savanna, light's every direction. And so you can tell a savanna-grown tree very easily, that's the shape. And I love that shape. It's beautiful. So I looked at the old photos of the, the savannas. I looked at my place. There it is again. And that's definitely an oak savanna. In fact, I can go to that picture, which is 1951, and find those individual trees. They're like that. And so, again, uh, in six, this is, I'm sorry, that was 40, this is 51, and this is uh, 63, they're still pretty open, and then the more recent one where it's all filled in. And even, uh, there's my house right up there, and the area just this side of the house was that open savanna. So, And these are large white oaks, by the way. That, uh, and so that, that's the area that got overgrown. I read a bunch of articles by people who have restored savannas. Uh, a fellow by the name of Carl DeLong at Grinnell worked on, on one for 15 or 20 years and found that um, once you clear the underbrush out and the, some of the trees and do some burning, forest herbs that you never saw before, all of a sudden show up. They've been there all along. And so, then he didn't, didn't plant them, but they apparently were able to survive, the roots survived, and when the system returned to an open savanna system, they sprouted. Probably the best, that everyone acknowledges, I guess, the best savannas in Iowa are by are those of Bill and Sibylla Brown down on the Missouri border, and I visited theirs also, and it is just amazing. So I got some help in trying to figure out what to do, thin out some of the non-savanna grown trees, pull out some of the thorny underbrush, ras black raspberries, blackberries, uh-oh, hmm. I can't see here, hello. Um, Mine is, went out, but it's still here, I guess. OK. As long as it's still there. Touch the screen with your hand. Touch the screen. Oh, sorry. OK, yeah, there we go. I forgot. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> All this modern technology. <clears throat> um, yeah, raspberries, blackberries, prickly ash, gooseberries. Burn the understory. And that's where the rule comes in of oak leaves. I don't know if you've looked very carefully at oak leaves once, once they've fallen off and compared them with other species of deciduous trees, but oak leaves kind of are crinkly, and they stay that way. They don't get matted by the weight of other leaves. And so you might not be able to burn a maple forest nearly as easily as you can burn an oak forest with those kinds of leaves. And I, in fact, I'd, some of these areas that I'd like to actually establish a savanna on, I can't because there's nothing to burn. The leaves won't burn. So um, this is a study by a retired um, botanist at the university by the name of Diana Horton. Uh, we don't want to raise your hand, Diana. <laughs> Thank you. And she uh, looked at the pre-settlement or, or the early um, surveyor's records, and uh, so uh, I'm right across the river from Rochester there, uh, and the uh, 
yellow squares are no trees whatsoever. Um, the black circles are, are what? Black oaks. Black oaks, right. And the, so, so anyway, you can see you're very close to the prairie forest border there. And so that makes a lot of sense too. Um, a friend of mine who teaches a, a soils class, Art Bettis over in the geology department, uh, brings his class out and takes a core, a soil core in my prairie, the, the, the prairie I planted. And I'm always kind of amused because the, the core comes out and he says, okay, what do you see here? Well, it turns out that that wasn't uh, in, quite in the prairie that was actually in the forest. Here he's showing his class, you know, this and, and seeing whether they can recognize that prairie, the prairie um, organic section is much thicker. Forests are very thin. So he goes just down the road and, and shows them a forest. But I'm, my prairie was a forest, but, but almost prairie, almost in the prairie. Okay, well, here's a view into my area near the house, and look at all those young trees coming up there. But look carefully and um, hmm, look at this tree here. It's got branches going way out that direction and, and the other direction. That's a savanna grown oak. Look what happens to it actually though. Those bottom limbs die. They're not getting any light. But it was a savanna grown tree. So. Here's one, here's the start then. We're burning in the savanna. And I burn it every year, either fall or spring. I couldn't get it, well, I had to really coax it to burn it all in the fall. And then I did a, I finally got a, a little bit of it burned in December and January. I don't have any records anywhere of anybody burning in December or January, but hopefully it will work. Um, there's some more fire, and you can see a whole pile of uh, cut wood there because we had thinned it out, and it, so it's <clears throat> much uh, thinner than it was. And so there are some of the savanna grown trees now that have much more open. Now I have to tell you, to warn you, uh, that oaks uh, don't like fire. In fact, they're kind of almost afraid of it. And I have photographic proof. Um, <laughs> um, actually, those, those uh, mouthpieces actually are fire scars. So that was burned. And that's why it stayed open for many, many years anyway. And probably after the burning uh, ceased, uh, maybe it was grazed in there. But at any rate, uh, both of those things are fire scars. And then here's some of the things that, uh, here's the plant coming in. Uh, it's, in this part, it still needs to be thinned a little bit. And I, I continue to thin it a little bit all the time. So, um, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Oops. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was hoping to get the savanna started um, between the, you can see what my house is, between there and this arm, this arm of the prairie, right in there. That's where all the honey locusts are and so forth. And so uh, some friends came and that's what, uh, how thick the underbrush was there before they got in there. That's what it looked like afterwards. And then I got all busy several years there after that, and now it's back to what it was, full of thorn bushes and stuff. So I'm going to go back and try it again. But there's nothing to burn there. That's the hard part. I'm not sure how to deal with that. So anybody have any ideas why that would be fine? OK. Now, I'm hearing some ohs and ahs from the audience. <laughs> Apparently, that's something you recognize. Well, um, one of the, the joys, I guess, of living out in the country, of course, is eating native plants, or eating wild plants, I should say. And um, I, just last week, 
made a very nice batch of garlic mustard pesto. <laughs> and it's actually quite good. So I encourage you all to eat about two or three pounds a week. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, that's garlic mustard. And you can see, if you hadn't seen it like that before, it, can, it will form a carpet. Now, I've got lots of nice wildflowers. They aren't going to make it under the garlic mustard. So what do I do? Well, this is a map uh, showing in early uh, areas the scientific name, scientific name of garlic mustard is alley area. So the A's are places, the big A's especially, are per areas where there were carpets. And we have been working on those for 13 years. And they have improved, but there are still some areas of carpets. And I have my own sort of way of doing of fighting them, actually. And that is, this is a sort of a giant weed eater. Now, I think the most common way of doing it is this going up and pulling it up. And then you have to bag it up. You can't leave it there. Or it will simply lie down, go to seed, and then you're just spreading it. I use this thing, and it's pretty efficient and pretty fast. And it has a couple of uh, things that are quite helpful, I guess. It's a biennial plant, and so the first years are like this, and then it shoots up in flowers and fruits. So if you're pulling garlic mustard, you're pulling these. Nobody's going to be pulling these things. They're only that high. So I've got this uh, weed eater thing, and I simply can go right down to the ground and or back and forth this way, whatever. I can get both first and second year plants at the same time, and they never sprout. At the same time, my wife, will, who also, uh, she'll go pull garlic mustard. But instead of bagging it up, I just have her lay it all down in the same direction on a big pile. Then I take my weed eater, and I simply chop it all up. And they have never sprouted either. So it's a different way of go dealing with it. Whatever way, somebody's got to deal with it. And I guess you do the best you can. Um, this is one of the areas that I, I came in then and used that. And that's what it looked like afterwards. Now, there's still some in there. I'm about to go back every year. But instead of our carpet, there's, oh, yeah, there's a couple over there. And oh, yeah, there's one. And that's not so bad. And that's a state park in Illinois. Those are, it's in the fall, and those are stems of garlic mustard. And I, I, I don't have any of the state parks in Iowa, but I think many of them are, are like that. And there's no money to, to deal with them. So well, this is a poor picture. And I unfortunately don't have a very good picture of this. But one of the other ones that I really, probably the most uh, difficult for me to deal with and that is autumn olive. And uh, it has uh, leaves that are sort of bright green on the top and kind of silvery underneath. Um, my uh, Bill Furnish, uh, <clears throat> I mentioned that uh, there were, these were all over the place. And he was encouraged by the then Conservation Commission in Iowa, I guess now it would be the DNR or any whatever, to plant autumn olive and multiflora rose because they're a good wildlife habitat. Some of you are shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, well, I said to Bill, why on earth did you plant these? His answer was, well, they, they make really good jam. <laughs> And by golly, they do. <laughs> but I'm not going to grow them for that. I'm sorry. Um, oh, if I'd have been thinking, I could have brought one along and had you taste it. Oh, well. Uh, so uh, here's another shot of that. And that's what the berries look like. Uh, they're um, just the size that birds can nicely get at. And, and the, I have tried to cut all the larger ones, and they can get to be like this and to be a 
quite a tall shrub. I've tried to get all those down uh, and either cut them down and stump spray them or whatever so that the big seed producers are gone. And, but it's too, almost too late because I'm walking around now and there's, you know, a hundred of them in just coming up all over the place. How do I deal with those? I don't know. Um, I'm going to keep at it, but uh, and uh, I um, I'm using a, something called Pathfinder 2. I like that on the bigger ones because you can uh, you can just simply spray around the base of the plant. You don't have to cut the plant off or anything, and you can spray it any time of year. Just spray around the base, and in six months it's dead. So. That has worked pretty well for me. All right. Um, and that's the one that has been sprayed. I sprayed it, and uh, you can go up and it just cracks off in your hand. It really does kill it. Well, there's our old friend Multiflora Rose. And this is what a thicket of Multiflora Rose was like uh, on part of my land. And I, I think that's probably about 15 feet tall probably about 100 feet long, 50 feet, 100 feet long, and solid, you know, uh, 15 or 20 feet deep. That was tough. But luckily, the rose chafer was, uh, came al along. It's a little bug that I found out about. And um, it carries what is apparently a virus. And that you start to see the effects of that with the, the reddish color and the sort of strange looking leaves there, knowing that's a sign that the, that the virus is on the plant and that plant dies. That whole thicket is gone. But I haven't seen any rose chafers much at all in the last couple of years. And now I've got little multiflores thanks to that. Uh, big thicket, I suppose, all, coming up all, all over the place. I just want you to know I have a lifetime job here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, here's another one, honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can s one good thing is you can see where it is in the fall because it keeps its leaves late. Uh, uh, whoops. And um, uh, I mean, it's, I thought I was on top of that. Well, it turns out it's showing up more different places that I hadn't seen it. So all these things you just have to keep after. Here's one maybe you don't know. Anybody know that one? Japanese knotweed. Yep, Japanese knotweed. It, um, it's quite an attractive plant, I must say. Um, there's a thicket of that. There is nothing that grows underneath that. There's the size of it. It's uh, you know eight, six, eight, ten feet tall, and it's uh, growing on the other side of the road that goes by my place, and it's started to grow on my side. Uh, it's in the knotweed family, and I expect that the birds eat the seeds and transport them or whatever. I don't know how how it gets around, but now. The, the one across the road goes all the way along my neighbor's fence, and uh, you know it's really hard to get rid of it. Very extensive root systems. Uh, I you yeah, you can see along all along the fence there. Um, I've started spraying this very carefully with uh, Pathfinder 2 also. As just as it comes up, I try to just hit hit that leaf. And you can't, you wouldn't know that it was here if, on my side if you walked along the road because it doesn't, kills it, and then they start coming back, and then I do it again. And if I didn't do it, I'm sure my, my side of the road would be, look the same as the other side. <clears throat> well, then there's the good stuff, of course. Just, in, just so you won't go away thinking, boy, what a rotten place he's got. <laughs> <laughs> 
Lots of nice flowers in the springtime, there's the Jacob's Ladder and Trout Lily, the one before, and there's a hickory bud just starting to open up. Um, isopyrum or fall through anemone, I guess it's not isopyrum anymore, but at any rate, uh, just a carpet of those. None of that's going to be here with garlic mustard taking over. Uh, um, oh, shoot. Trout, yeah, trout, yeah, the other one wasn't trout, that was, uh, anyway. I, that's, uh, when you get older, I know all these things. I just can't remember the name, that's all. <laughs> uh, this is a, a group of wetland plants down by the lower pond there. Uh, this is uh, quite a, this is a hibiscus, the native hibiscus, which I would not seen before, and I saw it growing down along a river and collected some seed, and it turns out it's a native Iowa plant got some seed going, and so I've got a few of these going, and boy, spectacular plants. I love them. Uh, that, that, this is, yeah, I'm still finding stuff new. I found this for the first time last summer. It is a native orchid, and it's called uh, Three Birds Orchid or Nodding Pogonia, and it turns out, uh, that I read about it, that it, it just comes up and it just flowers for a very brief time after a real cold spring day or something like that. I don't know, it's just very local. And I probably was walking by it for years and there might have been, I'm going to be real curious if it's still there, but uh, so I collected a little bit, I didn't know what it was and brought it back and sure enough, it's a, just a lovely little orchid. So that was a, a wonderful thing. Oh. Little birds' nests uh, walk by, and beautiful black swallowtail butterflies and cecropia moths. We, Deb has a real good eye for cocoons, and she found this cocoon, so we hatched this one out and let it go. And uh, there's a monarch caterpillar, and we had a, a nice bunch of um, a butterfly milkweed growing right along our sidewalk, coming into the house. And then I noticed that uh, they like, uh, monarchs like milkweeds, and there were some caterpillars there, and I oh well. Uh, and sure enough, they, they ate them all. There are not any of them there anymore. Well, I don't want to interfere with the monarchs either, so what are you going to do? Get a whatever. <laughs> oh, this is a thing I just, uh, been, we've been looking at it for years, and then I just last year read about other people that had brought it up on, I think, the native plant or insect list server. And the dragonflies. And a couple of days late in the summer, we look out our window, and there are just literally hundreds of dragonflies just zooming around our place. And I tried for several, a couple of years to get a picture of them, you know, and I never, you can't see them. Well, I, I got it just and happened to catch the light just right, and you can see that they are just, and I don't know, dragonflies are. I love them. They eat mosquitoes. <laughs> Sometimes you get a fox coming up in your yard. I, you wouldn't know that there were foxes. You hardly ever see them. But you go out in the winter, and there's fox tracks everywhere. But every once in a while, you get a chance to see one. This was uh, another new one for us, this, just this, uh, this uh, winter. Um, and I'd never seen one before, ever, and it's a bobcat. And it was walking right across the ice in our pond when I first saw it, and I thought, way down on the end, of, what is that? It's a coyote or something? And, no, it doesn't have a tail. And it, it's a bobcat. And by the time we got the camera out, it was behind some bushes here, and so we didn't get a very good picture of it. But it's there. You can see it. So that was uh, just a fact that we're still seeing new stuff. The other thing that I, we saw new this year, there's two or three otters swimming in our pond, one of our ponds, and just for a couple days, and wow. Anyway, um, and I have bluebird houses, of course, and hey, <laughs> that's not a bluebird. There's a little eastern gray tree frog in there, and I couldn't take him out. I just said, OK, go ahead. You can live there. Oh, sometimes we have geese nesting on the pond. And, um, sometimes you don't actually see the animal. No doubt about what it is, though. I actually have seen beavers 
on the uh, pond below the house a couple times. This is on the, the pond up um, east of the house. And they've been overwintering there for the last two winters, and I have not seen them once. But there's no doubt that they're there. I don't know if they come out out of their nocturnal beavers. I'm not sure. I don't know. Anyway, I just took this picture a couple of, uh, last week, I guess. Uh, and it was kind of neat because I've been trying to, I've, I've been wanting to clear the trees around this pond for a long time. Now I don't have to. <laughs> okay, well, turtles come up and lay their eggs in your yard. Sometimes you see deer on the ponds. Yeah, that's, this is, and the, uh, the bobcat was, at first he, he ran over this way, then he ran along the rim, then he came down here, and he was right behind those bushes there when I finally got the camera on him and got a, a picture of him. And then in the fall, you have nice fall colors, and that's the story. So thank you very much. I have a couple of quickie, other quickie things that I could mention. Uh, one is uh, a magazine I like very much, which is Woodlands and Prairies, done sort of locally, just by the, uh, around the Midwest by a guy named Raleigh Henkes. And uh, this, this is the most recent one, and they feature all kinds of people doing this kind of stuff. And if you, if you were interested in hearing what I was doing, you can read all other people doing lots of different kinds of things um, here. And you can, you can get him, you can Google him on just woodlands and prairies. He's, got a, he's, got a, he's also got a, a um, Facebook site. So. And it turns out I was featured in one of his articles. And so, uh, and how lucky can you get, it says. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Hello? Is this on? Oh, dear. Tell every. Okay, uh, we're just going to break for um, snacks now. We have um, cookies yeah. and coffee for, um, made by Project Green Volunteers, and there's lots of really good ones back there. So enjoy it. <laughs> Write down your questions that you have for Dick on a piece of paper, bring them up here to the podium, and in about 20 minutes, we will come back and Pick his brain with the questions, okay? What I'm going to do is uh, uh, call a couple of names, and you just come up and pick whichever door prize you want. You want. Um, that way, you can get the gloves that fit you. So let's. Shall we begin? I'm going to do two. Pick a name. Rosemary Tawari. All right. Congratulations. Dig down deep. Dig down deep. <laughs> <laughs> <Oof. Pick one. laughs> Jim Greasel. Okay, let's start with some questions. I live on a two acre wooded lot most of which are old oak. There are also many wildflowers, but as the wood, woods thicken, we have lost the shooting stars, most of the blood root. Will burning bring them back? My house is also on that lot. <laughs> <laughs> Use caution. <laughs> I can't guarantee that. that uh, I don't have a lot of experience, but I have found actually that when I'm burning places with bloodroot, it didn't come back. Um, the shooting stars are a little different. That probably would not hurt them at all. But um, I'm, I'm kind of guessing here, so my best guess. Is bee balm a native, native plant? And if so, does it survive burning? Everybody seems to want to know. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. OK. <laughs> read that later after I interpret it. <laughs> <laughs> what can be done in lieu of burning? Will mowing suffice? I am in an area where it is scary to burn and I have no water available. Thanks. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, is it a prairie that you're, you're burning? I guess it doesn't say. Um, 
No, he says. <clears throat> Hmm. Well, uh, certainly mowing uh, would help control some of the, the weedy things or some of the things that... Um, and in prairies, for example, they often say that, that uh, you can hay them and that is one way of... Uh, instead of burning, that's an alternate way of doing things. So... Um, what about hiring Liz Moss? <laughs> hiring Liz Moss would be a really good idea. She's a professional. She comes with all the equipment. She's has a large knowledge of different habitats and uh, much more than I. I mean, I'm just with these little... She's been doing all kinds of different things, and I highly recommend her. Pl part of the fact, of course, that she's a former student of mine. But, <laughs> How many years since you planted your prairie? Um, about 11, I think, yeah. And when you planted your prairie, did you use plugs or seed? I used seed from Carl Kurtz. He's a famous nature photographer and lives over uh, near St. Anthony. Um, he has changed his farm to prairie and if you ever get a chance to visit, it's really interesting because he can show you what... Um, he got all of his seed from a nearby uh, native prairie with permission. And uh, he, so you can see what it looks like. This, this is what he planted last year. This is what he planted five years ago. This is what he planted. So you can see the progression uh, through the years. And I went over there to do that, and it really was worth the trip. Tell us again how you killed your multiflora rose. Um, you were talking about some virus? Yeah. It's a uh, rose rosette virus. That's right. How do you get it? <laughs> um, well, it, it's carried by the, the rose chafer, which is a small insect. I think a beetle, isn't it? And I had heard that people have that, I don't know, the DNR or conservation, uh, County Conservation Board or whatever, got a hold of some of these and spread, spread them around. And um, once you get one, then I would, what I guess would do is grab an infected bit of the, the leaf of one plant or the stem of one plant, come over to one that's uninfected and say, meet the rose chafer. And, <laughs> Um, that that spread it nicely. It, it will kill other roses. It, yes, that's the one thing, is if you have roses in your garden, I mean, it will kill those too. So, but if you just have a place like mine with just wild multifloras, why you don't worry too much about that, I guess. And where do you get this bug? <laughs> Which book? Bug. Oh, bug. Yeah, I'm Insect. Talk to the DNR. Talk, talk, to, to, the talk DNR. to the DNR. Thank you. When you had ponds created at the edge of prairie, did you plant them with wetland plants or did they move in naturally? Yes. <laughs> Both? Both. Uh, one of the things that is amazing to me, I guess, is uh, cattails, which um, <clears throat> actually I work with fossil seeds, and so I know seeds pretty well, and cattails have really tiny seeds. And so without my doing anything, a whole raft of cattails got into a couple of my ponds the first year. Uh, on the other hand, I also uh, went and judiciously collected a few seeds from area wetlands nearby and put those in myself. And so both of those things worked. Tell them about the tree that you found, the oh, yes. prairie crab apple. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> uh, yeah, there turns out that there are no native large apple trees in North America. We always think about apple trees and, you know, Johnny Appleseed and all this other stuff. None of those are native trees. Is There's one little species that's a little tiny crab apples. It's called the prairie 
crab apple, prairie, Iowa prairie crab apple, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was walking around with a, a friend of mine, Bob Cruden, one day in the early spring, and we happened to look over and off into the woods just a little bit, and here was this tree with the lovely, I think slightly pinkish maybe, I don't even remember for sure, flowers, but it was certainly flowers that we thought, what in the world is this tree? And we went over and looked at it, and that's what it was. And I have two little groves, of, or not groves, a couple of little places where there are just a very few growing on my place. And it's a native, a native to Iowa. Were they there when you bought the property? Yes. Yep. How have former field areas been affected by staying fallow? Does this person ask about, about cornfields? Or? Who asked this question? Is that person here? Well, you had some hay fields or something. Yeah. Hay fields. And, and I assume you didn't plant anything in no. 40 acres or whatever. No, there are, I just have seven acres of, of hay fields. And I, I'm sur I've still sort of not decided what to do with them. Um, I, a neighbor of mine was buying the hay for a number of years, and unfortunately he died. <laughs> and I uh, haven't found a good use. I thought about putting him in prairie, but like uh, someone else said, uh, it's right next to my neighbor's place, and I would be a little uncomfortable burning there. Um, so I'm open to ideas, I guess, but um, I, I actually uh, joined the Practical Farmers of Iowa who, who uh, have a, a map showing uh, people that need land for planting or people that have land, and I, I said, we've got seven acres, does anyone want to farm it, and I haven't had a taker yet. So I'm not sure what's going to happen to it, but... Uh, yeah, well, it was mostly grass. Uh, the neighbor that used to uh, take hay from it uh, planted alfalfa, but it really never took hold very well. And since then, my other neighbor, who I don't get along too well with, um, <laughs> uh, has mowed uh, on my side of the fence for several years, creating open space which the non-native foxtail grasses have gotten into, and now they have sort of taken over the, the hay field. And I'm, I want to do something with it. I just don't know what. Does your closeness to the river help your animal habitat? <coughs> hmm. Well, it, it, it supplies the beavers, because that's where they are most of the time, and the otters, of course. Um, I'm not sure if that's... How else? Uh, oh, well, it, certainly, yeah. Birds, yeah, there's lots of eagles along the river, uh, for example, and, and they come from there and fly over our place and so forth. But, and lots of other birds we see walking when we walk down by the river that we wouldn't see otherwise. Sure, yep. I have a burning bush that is sending up shoots for several feet heading down a very steep hill. Would Pathfinder take care of this? I can't guarantee it because I think herbicides are somewhat species specific. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing that it would. But uh, Chance, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, well, you can get a non-specific herbicide like glyphosate. Yeah. That, like, sure. Talk to there's herbicide distributors that can give you lots of good information. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, glyphosate is certainly the Roundup, basically, is certainly the one of choice for many people, and it's broad based. So. But you were saying with the Pathfinder 2, you can just spray it around the base of a plant without cutting it off? It works especially well with uh, autumn olive. Now, I have found that it. I'm not certain I've given it enough time yet, but I, I'm not sure that it works with honeysuckle. I've sprayed it, and you know I need to come back now and to the bushes that I've sprayed, but it doesn't work as fast, at least on honeysuckle, if it works at all. I can't be sure that it works at all. This person that asked the question about the burning bush has a second part. Okay. 
the hill that he discussed is north facing. It is eroding. What can I plant that will hold the soil and not need cutting to look good? This is my front yard. <laughs> <laughs> um, north facing slope. Good question. Um, Grolo Sumac? Grolo Sumac? Sumac? Well, I'm going to do a few more door prizes and you can think on that, Dick. <laughs> Pick another name. Oh, okay. Maybe just come up here and choose your door prize. Carl Hilly? Yeah. <laughs> do another one. Oh, I want something. Wow. <laughs> <coughs> Where are you riding? Come on. <laughs> Actually, believe it or not. No. Paul, Paul Duran something. Durin yeah, Duran something. Hey, how'd you do that? <laughs> I, did, I didn't look. Uh, Again, if you take one of the Pleasant Valley um, offerings, be sure to thank them when you go in. Okay. Barb Hansen. Barb Hansen. Too bad she's gone. <laughs> you got to be here to get your door prize. Peter Hessler, is that right? A little hard to read your red, you guys. Becky Lido, Lido. <laughs> <laughs> Carla McGrail. This person coming up here, guys, is going to be one of our speakers next year, so have a good look at her. <laughs> What's her topic going to be? What's her topic going to be? I'm not sure we've decided. Yeah. Artist Barnhart. Still going? Yeah, we got three more. Oh my gosh. Laura Hawks. <laughs> 